Hi everybody, welcome once again. I'm Imran Garda and you're in the stream. Today, the largest demonstrations in Canadian history. Our student protests in Quebec sparking a broad popular uprising. Remember, you can live tweet our digital producer, Malika Bilal, with questions and comments using the hashtag AJStream, and uh, we'll include as many as we can throughout the program. Hi, Malika. Hey, Ron. With on the orange couch is Tim McSorley, editor mm -hmm. at Media Co-op, a network of local news organizations across Canada. Uh, Tim, welcome to the stream. Looking forward to hearing all of your thoughts. Thanks a lot. Now, you can also follow on-the-ground developments relating to the protests in Quebec by following some of these hashtags. Clanging pots and pans are sounding across the streets of Montreal as hundreds of thousands of Quebecers take part in what is being termed the Maple Spring, Canada's largest and longest protests ever. Let's take a short look. I think that it started by a education. It's become a debate about society, about what kind of government we want, what kind of future we want for the generations. I think that there is a great general against the way the politics is made and the way the society functions. We want other things. The rest of the Canada should understand that here, our government doesn't listen to us. Euh, ils passent des lois antidémocratiques qui nous permettent de ne pas nous exprimer. Là, ici, je parle évidemment de la loi 78. La plupart des gens que vous voyez ici, ce n'est plus des étudiants. C'est des gens qui sont dans la quarantaine, ils ont les cheveux gris. Donc, c'est plus large que le mouvement étudiant. Pour la grandeur du mouvement, qui ne s'est jamais arrivé aussi gros, ben moi, je suis un peu stupide ce qu'on nous offre. Puis, euh, on trouve que c'est vraiment, on dirait qu'on nous prend pour une chose. So you've heard from the protesters themselves there. It all started three months ago when the provincial government announced a 75% increase on uh, university tuition fees. But after continued demonstrations, the government passed an emergency law known as Bill 78 in an attempt to crack down on protests. Since its implementation, over a thousand people have been arrested and more than 10 injured. Well, with other Canadian cities joining Montreal in solidarity, student government talks uh, failing to reach an agreement last week as well, and protesters promising not to back down. Some suggest the movement has become a broad, popular uprising, challenging the country's political institutions. So what are the goals of the Maple Spring and what does all of this mean for Canada? Joining us via Skype from Montreal is Yannick Gregoire, Vice President of the Quebec University Student Federation. And also from Montreal is Gabriel Nadeau-Dubois, spokesman of the Class Student Association, representing more than 100,000 students boycotting classes in the province. Yannick, Gabriel, welcome to the stream. Let me start with you, Yannick. Are we still talking about fees or uh, have we moved beyond that a long, long time ago? Oh no, we still talk about tuition fees. Most of the demonstration have a large part of students in it. Then what they want is the, uh, the fight against the tuition fee. But also with the Bill 78, of course, uh, most, uh, a lot of citizens have joined the student in the in the streets and now uh, the the fight has become a little bit larger and mm -hmm. they want uh, that bill to be uh, to be cut off. Okay, let's try to find out what that bill actually is and what it stipulates. Bill 78 suspended the current academic term. Uh, let's have a look here. I've got this, this graphic from one of the articles which gives you some bullet points regarding it. Uh, it also requires demonstrators to inform police about the roots of any protests involving 50 or more people and imposes fines of up to $125,000 on student associations that disobey. Uh, Tim, it seems as if you can do everything that doesn't involve having a protest to get the right to protest. Th th that's it. The, the point of protesting is to have these popular, immediate uh, chances to speak out and, and protest and, and get your voice heard. And uh, if you need to go to police um, eight hours in advance or any time in advance in order to uh, make sure that you can actually hold a protest and get their approval, um, you're not really in a position where you can be challenging any kind of power, let alone it be mm -hmm. state or municipal or, or anything like that. So it really, it, it's really put a freeze on, or they've tried to put a freeze on 
uh, protests, as we've seen in, in across Montreal and now across Canada, people are speaking out and, and coming out in record numbers mm -hmm. um, against, uh, against this bill and against these laws. Okay, before we dip into the community with uh, Malika, let me ask Gabriel. Gabriel, the government is making uh, both, you know, from uh, provincially from Quebec and the Canadian government as a whole, they're making fiscal arguments saying this is kind of unreasonable from the students. Do you believe them at all? Well, uh, when we when we look clearly at the uh, financial situation of Quebec, we, what what we understand, in fact, is that everything is a matter of choice. Uh, I, I will give only uh, only one example. In the last year, the Charest government here has announced a major uh, mining exploitation plan for the uh, for the Quebec Great North, which is called the Plan Nord, and only the part of public money that will go to fund the routes. To, uh, for the mining company uh, is up to uh, $250 million, which is exactly the amount of money that will be uh, taken by the government in the pockets of the students with is increasing of tuition fees. So it's only one example, but it gives, it gives a little bit an idea of, uh, of, uh, of the reason why the students here are angry mm -hmm. about the government that is on one end saying that there is no money to fund education, but on the other end, is giving major gifts to the big corporations. Right. So the kind of contradiction that puts uh, people in the street these days in Montreal. Okay, Malika. Well, not all of our community members see it as a contradiction, uh, as you just mentioned. Mother Earth here on Twitter says, they are spoiled, nothing more, lots less. They have all they need, including free time on their hands. Um, but Tim, Taking that, I'd like you to listen to this video uh, comment from one member of our community, um, and uh, let me know what you think. My name is Aidan McDonald, and I'm a student at Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada. I think the mobilization in Quebec is incredibly inspiring. It's a rejection of an increasingly unaffordable post-secondary education, and it's a struggle for education as a right. But it's no longer just about students, as there are massive numbers of people from all walks of life who've joined the struggle to stand up against the broader political agenda that places the burden of public debt on those who are already the most marginalized. People are now fighting not just for accessible education, but for a vision of a just society that respects the rights of people rather than serving the interests of political and corporate elites. So, Tim, how do we merge those two things? People seeing you as spoiled and others right. who see it as education is a right. Well, that's definitely been the, the dichotomy throughout the, the, the student strike in Quebec. And definitely the, the overwhelming message I've seen a lot of, in a lot of media has been this idea that students are spoiled. And it's been the message of the Quebec government. Um, but I think if, if we look at it, if it doesn't just come down to this argument of, of dollars and cents. Quebec has the lowest tuition fees, but that's because it's something that people have fought for and put as a priority for, the, for several decades now in Quebec, ever since the 1960s. And so to say that we're spoiled in Quebec because we have low, low tuition fees, we could flip that question on its head and say, well, why aren't other places fighting for accessible education if it is a right and, and, uh, and um, a right that we hold and a benefit that we hold dear and that we think is important for the population? Okay, to, to take that theme and, and to continue it, uh, Sam Katz tweeting in, and I wonder what Yannick thinks about this. Sam tweeting in four hours ago, saying, as a Canadian, I am insulted that the tui um, you know, by the tuition protests in Quebec. It's the lowest rates in the country. So Yannick, Sam, I suppose, in, is in, in the camp where he's saying, you guys are spoiled. What are you protesting for? There's, there's two points about that. First, you mentioned it. It's a, so a choice of a society to have the low tuition fee to encourage most people to go to university and have, have a degree and then get jobs that are going to be uh, fit in the economy of tomorrow. But also, uh, we have to remember that uh, students live with about $12,000 a year. So a uh, hike of sixteen twenty-five more, or now seventeen seventy-eight more dollar, is a large amount of their annual budget. So not all students are rich, spoiled kids. There's some, there's some of, of, of course, that have uh, some money, but there's a lot of them that don't have it. So what they're, they're fighting is there for their life condition also. So no, you cannot gener uh, generalize from rich, rich kids. There's some, but most aren't, in fact. Okay, let's, let's go to Gabriel. Gabriel, the Grand Prix is happening in Montreal. All eyes will be on Montreal. What other plans? Any plans to disrupt the Grand Prix? Well, for our part, as a student organization, what we are planning is essentially an action of visibility and information. So we want to take advantage of the Grand Prix and, uh, and, uh, and of all the other major touristic events that will occur this summer in Montreal to enter in a dialogue 
with the population and to distribute information to the citizens and to the tourists uh, in order to explain to them uh, the reasons of our fight in order to dis to uh, maybe uh, go uh, to maybe disconstruct some prejudice that have been said in the last month uh, uh, towards us. So it's, the objective will really be to inform the people and not to block some citizens to go to the events or to put their security in danger. That's very clear from our part. Okay. Well, Yannick, you raised an early, uh, a good point, I think, a little bit earlier, um, that one member of our community um, has the same views on. And there's a video question here. Um, have a listen. Hi, my name is Magda, and I'm a PhD student at Concordia University in Montreal. One thing I'd like to say that really bothers me is the um, opposition of taxpayers and students as if students are not taxpayers as if students don't have jobs and pay taxes for all kinds of things and another thing is that high taxation rate in Quebec is something significant to consider when you're thinking about uh, the low tuition rates in Quebec thank you Yannick so about the opposition between taxpayers and students for the students that aren't taxpayer at the moment they are at, at the university they will be after that and for each dollar put in the education of a student, it's 530 that will come back more at, to the state per each dollar put in the education of the, of the student. So that's a good investment for the state to put money in the universities and in the, into accessibility to the universities since it's going to get back more after that in, in, uh, in taxes. So is that an argument that you put forward to the government in these negotiations? And why hasn't that been picked up on? Yeah, absolutely. What we say is that we need to we need to open the, the doors to the university now so that the people afterward will be able to contribute to the state to be able to found retreat also of the baby boomers and the government is saying we can't we can't offer that but what we found out in the last negotiation is that we found, we found money to put in the university in the accessibility at a zero rate cost for the for the taxpayers and the government finally said what we want in fact is that you pay they want, they want students to pay it. No right. matter how many money we can put in university, what's this? it's an ideological decision, it's a political decision, it has nothing to do with economy. Okay. And that's, a, that's something we found pretty, pretty uh, okay. insulting. A fair point, uh, Yannick. There is a civil liberties aspect to this, both in terms of people feeling the police uh, embarked on a heavy-handed crackdown against the protesters, and also with regards to Bill 78, as it is you know, enshrined. Uh, we spoke to Natalie de uh, Rosier, the general counsel of the Canadian uh, Civil Liberties Association. Let's listen to what she had to say. Bill 78 on its face violates the freedom of expression, the freedom of peaceful assembly, and the freedom of association. So the, the question that the government will have to answer is whether it imposes reasonable limits to these freedoms through this act. And certainly uh, the position of uh, many and of our association is that those are not reasonable limits. They are over broad and arbitrary and exposes peaceful protesters to become criminals without their knowing. So it's a dangerous piece of legislation. If this piece of legislation is validated by the courts, I think it will be a real loss for Canadian uh, freedom of expression across the land. It's the, uh, is the test of how far can government go when they, are, they want to curtail uh, freedom of uh, peaceful assembly. And we just want to reiterate, I mean, we are actually next to the Canadian Embassy here in Washington, D.C. We did reach out to the Canadian government and you know, we haven't got a spokesperson. We would have loved to have that view on air. Uh, Gabriel, Looking at Bill 78 again, is there any way there could be some sort of compromise? Is there any way that, given the current text, it could be workable? Uh, this, this, uh, you know, this piece of legislation is very problematic on, on, on a lot of points, and it would be very difficult for me to, to, to take one article that I would say would be acceptable for the students and, and for the civil society of Quebec in general. Uh, I mean, there's, I, I mean, probably the only part of the law which which can stay is the fact that the, the, the semester are, are, are suspended. But all the other articles that, uh, that uh, concern, for example, the right to protest or uh, the, the fines that are associated with the fact of breaking this law, uh, the fact that the, the law um, now uh, 
says to the student uh, associations that they cannot, in fact, do picket lines to be sure that their strike mandate is, mm -hmm. is respected. All, all those articles in the law are is are very problematic for us, and it would be, I think, impossible okay. to have a, okay. a, a, a well, uh, point well made. Point with the government on okay. those issues. I think the, the the only choice that can make the government is to uh, is to retract that bill. Okay. Uh, Fair enough, Gabriel. You, that you, exactly you made your point, Gabriel. Gabriel, Gabriel we, I want to move on to to Yannick. Uh, forgive me for interrupting you, uh, Yannick. Uh, the Quebec Premier uh, Jean uh, Jean Charette said. Quote, ultimately, there'll be an election in 18 months. He's saying if you have a problem, do it at the polls. How would you respond to that? Democracy isn't only the voting process. It's also the right of people to speak out loud in the streets, and in the place they want, to say that they aren't or are agreeing with the decision of the government. What the Bill 78 is doing is they are chopping off the legs of the people in the streets. They can be illegal and have large large uh, fine for doing a, a demonstration. But of course, as, a stu as students, we'll go vote when it's going to be time. At the first, we're, we're ready to go there. But what we say is that a government should listen to its population. And now the population is in the street and, they are ca and they're calling for two simple things, no tuition fee hike and no Bill 78. Mm -hmm. I think that if, if, if we're in a real democracy, the government should uh, listen to the people and try to work out uh, a compromise, which it didn't, it didn't do in the last okay. negotiation. Okay, we try now. to be a real democracy here as well, and we try to give everybody uh, a, an opportunity to speak to us and to speak to you. Malika is having a look at the tweets. Exactly, and Tim, I'm going to direct this one to you. Um, Gabriel mentioned a little bit earlier about the problematic aspects of the law. And there's a tweet here just about three minutes ago, Aaron tweeted, uh, directed at you. Okay. The discourse now on the student strike should also focus on demand for amnesty for all arrestees. Now, we've seen several arrests during these protests. Yeah. Um, and in your coverage of this, what are you seeing? And, and, and is that one of the things that people are demanding? That's definitely a growing demand and one that's been put out there. And it's because if, if we do really feel and if people do feel and if th that this law is uh, unconstitutional and, and, and breaches people's right to protest and assembly, then, uh, then I think the demand for amnesty and for clemency for anybody who's been charged under these, uh, these laws um, is real, really important. An important thing to point out too though is that there's actually been very few people who have been charged under law 78. Mm. The police have been using other laws including a new Montreal municipal bylaw passed the same day that brings in the same kind of rules um, as well as highway code violations in order to try to charge people in different ways. So even if law 78 is invalidated, there's still a lot of questions about police tactics and the crackdown on protests that we've been seeing across the province. Tim, I want to step back for a second and try to further contextualize this, to what extent should we be looking at this as Quebec only, given Quebec is our staunchly independent, there's a you know, reasonable amount of autonomy mm -hmm. um, there, uh, particularly for the international audience who might not know the history of, say, Quebec vis-a-vis -vis Canada. For how sure. much of it does uh, has to do with, with, with Canada and how much of it has to do with Quebec? Well, the, the current crisis around the tuition fee issue is clearly rooted in, in Quebec. It's a Quebec issue. But tuition fees are an issue that Canadians are facing across the country. Uh, Quebec has the lowest tuition fees, as we've mentioned. So it's not, in that respect, it's not just Quebec. Um, Quebec has its own particular history. There's a, there's a strong history of, of social movements and protest movements and of, uh, of democracy that doesn't end at the ballot box and that can also be felt in popular assemblies and mobilizations. And that's a little bit different from, from other parts of Canada. So there's definitely that history in Quebec going back to the Quiet Revolution in the 1960s where um, there's a, a greater willingness to embrace those kinds of tactics. Mm -hmm. We don't see student strikes like what we see in Quebec across the rest of Canada. Um, we have a stronger labor movement in some ways in Quebec as well, although yeah. it's changing. And, and I, want, I want to pose that to Gabriel. Is that the fear? Is that the fear that you are losing what made you se uh, special and distinct in, in terms of Canada's history? It, it's clearly uh, one of the preoccupations of the students in strike. I mean, uh, people here in Quebec uh, are proud of having those differences with the rest of Canada. Uh, people here in Quebec are proud of having in a public and uh, very accessible education system. People here in Quebec are proud to have a completely free and public health system. And, and those advantages that we have uh, uh, against the rest of Canada, people are, are very proud of those differences and they want to keep those differences. And it's clearly one of the reasons why they are fighting, actually. They, basically, they're saying we don't want to do the same, the same mistakes 
at the mistakes of the rest of Canada did by increasing their tuition fees. Well, Yannick, I want to take this uh, conversation back to some of the divisions. Uh, Jonathan tweets, there appears to be a division between Anglophones and Francophones. Uh, he says Montreal's Anglo University and college students have generally voted not to join the strike. Uh, and he's joined by Chris, who tweets, they're asking people, meaning the students, to get behind their cause when I can't see them returning the favor from past experience. What do you say to people um, that aren't behind this? I'd say that, that in fact, the English students uh, in in Montreal have joined the movement that like we've never seen it before in the story of the student movement. Uh, Concordia has been a full week of strike. Uh, it's something that has never been seen before. And all the student association of uh, uh, English universities have stepped forward saying that they don't want a tuition fee like as well as the French uh, association. So there's a unity between uh, the students no matter what language they speak in right now. Okay. Well put, Yannick, and you'll get an opportunity to flesh that out and demystify some of it in our post-show, which we will be having in just a couple of minutes' time. So everybody, stay where you are. We'll continue this discussion in our post-show. Uh, now, uh, before we do that, here's Malika with some other story leads that we've been following. It's not often that the president of any country engages in a heated spat on the web. But the leader of Estonia apparently did just that when he slammed a New York Times columnist over Twitter for a blog post deemed critical of the country. In his blog, Paul Krugman called Estonia the poster child for austerity defenders, arguing that the country has not really achieved economic recovery. Well, Estonia responded with posts on the Twitter account used by President Tomas Hendrik Elvis. Though the handle is not officially verified, Elvis has in the past linked to it on his Facebook page. Let's write about something we know nothing about and be smug, overbearing, and patronizing. After all, they're just wogs. He continued, guess a Nobel in trade means you can pontificate on fiscal matters and declare my country a wasteland. Well, Krugman responded explaining what he believes Estonia should be doing instead. Tell us what you think of their spat. Tweet us using the hashtag AJStream. Imran? Yes, thanks, Malika. That's all for now, but uh, we're going to continue this discussion, as I said, stream.aljazeera.com in the post show. Now, before we go, this is my last show for the stream and the end of six and a half years at Al Jazeera for me. I want to thank everyone in the community for all of your interaction with me and the show. It's been quite an educational experience with you, our community, Malika, Ahmed, Derek, and all our exceptional behind the scenes team members over the past year as we explored bridging news and social media and of course, getting all of your voices heard. And speaking of our community voices, we've received some tweets about your last day. We asked <laughs> our community members to send us their favorite Imran moments. We've collected them all on our website at stream.aljazeera.com, and I'll just read two of them here. Bray Close says, when he stands up and hands over the report, I keep it on my phone. I've watched it so many times. She's referring, of course, to this moment, uh, the show about Bahrain's independent commission report, where you handed uh, the commission's report to Bahrain's finance minister. Right. Uh, and one other tweet, Jafar Noor says, when he read my first tweet on AJ Stream about Facebook. So people can go to our website, stream.aljazeera.com, for the rest of those. Well, thanks. Thanks, Malika. Thank you very much. Well, the stream is also on the move, and will be based in Al Jazeera's broadcast center here in Washington, D.C., just a few blocks away. So next week, uh, the stream will be running some of your favorite recent shows. And then it will be back with a new look, but of course with the same emphasis on putting social media at the center of everything that we do. So we'll see you online. Thanks for watching and bye-bye.
Welcome back. I have 10 minutes left in my contract, so I've got to do the post show. No, just kidding. We're looking forward to uh, fleshing out some of the rest of the arguments with regards to the Quebec uh, student protests. Um, Tim, Gabriel, and Yannick are still standing by. Tim, I wonder when you look at uh, the broader social media, uh, social uh, movements that have happened both here in the United States, in Canada, and elsewhere, how would you um, define what's happening in Quebec? as compared to the Occupy Wall Street movement, right. protests in the rest of the world, the Arab Spring? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, obviously, in each region, in each country, th there's a different reason why people are speaking out. But I think what we're seeing now is there's these ruptures, these schisms that are opening up, whether it's in the Occupy movement across the United States and in Canada as well, whether or not it's the Arab Spring or what's going on in Quebec, that we see these opportunities are opening up where people are creating spaces where we can start exploring just different ideas and rejecting old systems. So mm -hmm. I think in Quebec, especially with, uh, we've had 45 nights right now mm -hmm. of, of demonstrations in Montreal. Uh, we see the pots and pans demonstrations happening, beginning spontaneously and spreading across the country. And it, and it creates a space where people can adopt those tactics and those ideas and focus it on to local issues. So I think that while the tuition fight was coming a long time before mm -hmm. we started talking about the Occupy movement in Quebec, I think the, the momentum of that and the ideas and, and the discourse it creates really help to uh, get, give it strength. And we're seeing it now across Canada with the fight against um, another federal law mm -hmm. that's passing changes to environmental assessments and, and old age security and things like that. So it, it's creating a, just a space for us to, for people to, to speak out. And I think that's the, the power of these movements around the world right now. Yannick, do you consider yourself an extension of the Occupy movement, if not operationally, at least ideologically? What would be sure for for sure is that the uh, as the student movement, as the Occupy uh, Montreal movement, or all the Occupy movement, we have been fighting against a uh, decision that would be uh, made unilaterally, and of course neoliberalism uh, issues. For our part, it's mostly centered around the tuition fee hike, but of course there's some there's some similarities. We can we can tell it's no. Malika. Well, speaking of Occupy, Eric Garland tweets: Quebec is a stronghold in the fight against this constant renegotiation downward of the future. It's deeper than Occupy Wall Street, though, he says. It could spread. Um, and I wonder, that kind of leads us to this video comment here um, on the international role that this possibly has. Uh, Gabriel, take a, have a listen. It's deeper than Occupy Wall Street, though, he says. It could spread. Um, Got it? Sorry, seems to be having a little bit of a technical difficulty there. But I wonder, uh, Gabriel, if you could speak to us on the international role and if there is an international role um, and what, what role other people can play in helping these students. Well, uh, you know, uh, to, to just to come back to the Occupy Wall Street movement, I think that our movement here against tuition increase is part of the same wave of reaction against austerity and neoliberalism than, than what we have seen in uh, in U.S. for the Occupy Wall Street or in Europe with the Indianados movement. Uh, and the, I think the, the, the best international role that, that people can, can play is to be mobilized in their own community, not only in solidarity with our strike, but to make education accessible elsewhere also, and especially to, to the students in the rest of Canada. I, I would invite them to, uh, to, to be inspired by our fight, by the way we have, uh, we have mobilized, and to do the same thing, to, to make sure that education is accessible, not only in Quebec, but in the rest of Canada and U.S., and, and ideally all over the world. Okay, Tim, that sounds great, but how realistic is it that these protests will spread mm, to the rest of Canada? Forget the rest of the world for now. We can never predict. So there's a possibility it could. There's a lot of energy right now. Just last night, um, there were 125 solidarity pots and pans casserole demos around the world and across Canada. And so definitely it's unpredictable when these things can, can strike. But I think uh, if we had said that people would be talking about the Arab Spring in uh, the U.S., if we would be talking uh, during Occupy, if we'd be talking about the protests in Greece and in Spain and Quebec um, just last year then I think people have said well we don't know there, there's no so I think it's that idea that there's this possibility and I think there is across Canada at least right now I think there is a, a growing anger and frustration with our political system mm -hmm. that rewards a first-past-the-post system a government that wins 50 percent of the seats 
controls for four years when maybe they only won 30% of the popular vote and the other opposition parties have no say and popular movements and people movements have no say over four or five years. So I think there's a, there's a growing groundswell and we, we can't predict where it's going, but uh, I have hope after seeing what, what's been going on in Quebec that, uh, that these kinds of popular movements can spread anywhere right now. Well, Tim, you, you mentioned growing anger. There's one more video comment that I'd like to play um, along those lines. Have a listen. My name is Jess. I'm in occupied Coast Salish territory. I think the Canadian Anglophone media commonly misconstrues the Quebec student movement as being solely against tuition increases when really it is a critique of a lot more, including federal austerity measures such as Bill C-38, which spells disaster for everything from um, environmental research to foreign workers coming to Canada hoping to seek a fair wage. And I hopefully the rest of Canada wakes up from complacency and joins the students. It, it's, it's, yeah, I agree completely. It's, it's definitely a timely message to get out there. Um, bill C-38 is a, an omnibus bill, a, a budget bill, as, as often comes up in the United States and other countries, where they're trying to, uh, the government is pushing through multiple measures um, in one bill, and people, even conservative supporters, have been denouncing it as undemocratic. So there's a widespread base of people speaking out against this bill right now, and there's a strong chance that, that it can spread, and, and this idea that it's relegated to only as a tuition fee issue or to this issue of young people wanting more and more, I think, uh, I think it's only the mainstream media that's promoting it and I think that there's a, a lot of voices out there uh, across Canada and around the world who are starting to chip away at that idea because a lot of mainstream media is also part of that 1% that people are critiquing right now. Right. Okay, I think that's a good point to stop the discussion. Now, thank you very much, uh, everybody, to McSorley here on the couch. Uh, Gabriel Nadeau-Dubois and Yannick Gregoire joining us via Skype. Great pleasure having all of you on the show, uh, explaining and demystifying some of the Quebec uh, student, uh, students' gripes and perhaps charting a way forward. Uh, we wish you all the best, and thanks for joining us. Thank you, thank you very much. And Imran, right before we go, oh, no. uh, our great uh, studio producers and our video producer have created a little montage of some of our favorite moments. So have a look. Time to cringe. <clears throat> people hang on his every word. Hi, everybody. Positions. And not to bomb people from the sky if you don't. He could disarm you with his looks or his hands. Either way, he can speak French in Russian. He is the most interesting man in the world. You guys are really unprofessional. I'm trying to concentrate and prepare for my show, and all you can do is just laugh and, you know. <laughs> okay, I have nothing to say. Thank you, Malik. Of course. Bye bye, everyone. Thanks for watching. And uh, of course, don't forget the stream will be uh, live again in a couple of weeks' time. You'll see some of the stream's favorite shows next week. Bye bye. <laughs>